for a break, I've been thinking about your visit and what I wanted to talk about today. And it came back to me a question that a colleague of mine recently asked me as I was talking about my African Diva project. And the question was, how do I address accusations before I haven't really had any yet, but the possible accusations of my project being exploitative of the uh, attention that has been given recently to black lives. And so I do have an answer to that, sort of an answer to that. Um, the African Diva project itself has been rolling and working for the last 15 years. And I'm 65 now, and I have spent all of my professional scholarly life as an academic working on creating a rise in um, visibility of African American art and artists within the American canon and within the Western canon. So as an art historian, my uh, allegiance to black lives, particularly in art history, has been very much focused. And I can't imagine that I would be accused of being exploitative, uh, especially if you look at the amount of inventory of my paintings that are sitting in storage right now. So, what I do want to share with you, though, is one particular story around a painting that hasn't really gotten much attention and a painting that I struggled with, even though it appears to be one of the more simple um, in terms of structure in the African Diva project from the Side A group, which was uh, 33 and a third and taken from LPs. <music> Let me introduce you to Yoruba Didi. African Diva, I think 2010. Anyway, I had the fortunate invitation to have a solo museum exhibition in Biloxi, Mississippi mm -hmm. at the Oro Keith Museum, which is this wonderful little jewel box of a museum designed by Frank Gehry that's right on the Gulf Coast in Biloxi. And the curator chose which African divas she wanted to have in the exhibition. And it wasn't until I saw the list and started signing off on contracts, etc., that I realized that Didi was not included. And later, I mean, I didn't, most of the divas, actually all of the divas that were finished by that time that were available and some that were borrowed from collectors. Thank you, collectors, if you're in here. Um, I, it is collectors that have kept me making more. And then, of course, a, a, just a, a compulsion that and an obsession with the beauty of the black female body and of the black body in general. And then my true enjoyment of working with costuming and color, with shapes, with forms, but I'll talk more about that later. Anyway, this is where the image came from. Uh, Dee Bridgewater's Just Family album, where she is perhaps on the Mojave Desert, I'm not quite sure where, but she is standing here nude and pregnant. This was the only nude in the first and the side A of the entire. As a matter of fact, looking for nudes, and other artists will tell you this, and past artists, we have had quite a bit of uh, research and ink has been spilled on where the black nude comes from that artists have used, especially black male artists. Uh, Renee Bearden being one of them who uses collage, which means he had that something to cut out. And he was looking at pornography or soft porn, Playboy, et cetera, that kind of thing. So, but to find a black nude body on an album cover from the 70s 
or the 80s or the 90s actually, is very unusual. And so I grabbed at the chance of doing Dee Dee Bridgewater, especially since I really like her work as well. So I created this piece. And I'll tell you, I said from the beginning that I struggled a bit with this piece, not because of its nudity, and this, you know, the fact that it is a very dark silhouette. I asked the curator after the show was up why this painting was omitted from the inventory for the show. And she said she felt that it might create too much controversy because of its very blackness, because of its nudity, even though it's in silhouette. And the fact that I chose a Yoruba body mask, gold, that this is a Galede, one part of a two-part costume for the Galede ceremony, um, that accentuated, actually created more of a nudity for her, even though she was covered. Now I want to show you the mask itself, which I purchased from a collector. I'll show you the mask here. I purchased it from a collector in Princeton, Massachusetts, who worked for Shell Oil in the 1970s in Nigeria, and actually purchased this and had it regilded. Re so I can imagine when he, when he uh, purchased it, it was probably had been used, and he wanted it as a sculptor himself, he wanted it to be more of a decorative object or an object that stood out. So he had it regilded. It's a pretty fabulous thing. Um, and I didn't at first see it on Dee Dee. My first thought was to do as I did with all the other African divas, was to put a face mask on her. And I did do that. And it just didn't work. It didn't work. I turned it to the wall. This is what I do with my paintings when I find myself stuck. I turned it to the wall. And at that time, there was just the, the, uh, the lettering was not there. That's the very last thing that I do on the paintings is to put the cold wax and do the lettering. It was just a plain blue background, her silhouette, and the mask. And this was the mask. It's a very sweet ballet mask um, with the Sankofa bird hanging off of it, and it's in a profile. Uh, it's not a mask that I own. It's a mask in uh, probably a very prominent collection. I probably I saw it in a book. And I painted it on paper, which is how I do all of the first side. The side A divas all have their masks painted on paper and attached to the canvas my way of showing that there are two entities that I'm bringing together. And the Yoruba mask, the Yoruba Galede Festival, is um, a celebration of what the Yoruba refer to as the mothers, all mothers, the deities, the living, the ancestors, the mothers, the most powerful entity in any uh, group that keeps us alive the mothers. And of course, with a pregnant Yoruba image here, I am placing Dee Dee in that position as being one of the mothers. All of my African diva paintings are meant to bring African American performers back to the motherland. And I don't mean that in a really kitschy way either. I mean that the African mask is a part of, a big part of how others, outsiders, know Africa. And yet they really don't know African Americans. And many African Americans don't know what the masks represent. And now there are so few ceremonies and rituals left, thank goodness the, the Galede still continues and resonates in Carnival in many other parts of, of the world. I felt that 
it was necessary to bring these two things together. And it's very personal. I really love female voices. I love a great ballad, and that doesn't matter if it's a female or a male voice. And I have begun to bring male um, celebrities into the African Diva Project slowly. But I also am very attached to what I remember in my youth around listening to music and the culture of the LP and the LP jacket and what it meant to own one, which I didn't own many. I never had enough money to have, you know, what would be considered a massive collection of music. Um, I used to mostly listen on the radio. Of course, now we stream. But, but this piece had to change. I peeled off the mask. It's, this is the only painting where I have had to do that. I actually peeled the mask off of the canvas and set it aside. As you can see, I couldn't leave it be. I actually did do a, a print and then a hand, this is a hand painted print where I used the painted mask and put it back in place in a different venue. And then I brought out the body mask. And this really sang for me. This made perfect sense for me. After I figured out that it was the body mask that belonged here, it took me less than a week to finish this painting. I, I'm, I'm, I love it. It makes sense to me. It's exciting that I had a nude body to work with, even though I really get a kick out of doing clothing and working with the illusion around folded fabrics. This piece is perfect. And this piece gets no respect. I don't know how to put a better spin on what it means and how, how deep the spirituality behind something like this is and how daring Dee Dee Bridgewater was to stand naked and nude for her album cover. But here it is. Here it is. And the nude has not returned to the African Diva Project until Lizzo. When you entered, I was playing uh, Truth Hurts by Lizzo. I have to say, uh, she is uh, a soloist who has grown on me. Sister is audacious. And this image from her Cause I Love You album, which is a streaming album more than anything else. I mean, this is the image that I created from a digital photograph. Um, I, I, watch, I used an online image in my laptop to paint this, which is the first time that I've actually done that. I usually have a hard copy of some kind to work with, but not for this one. Lizzo's body is her costume. And you know, if you've seen the sister perform or in her music videos, her body is so expressive and it is so amazingly active, of course she's super young, that this image makes perfect sense for this artist. In the end, there's no surprise that she has a nude image beautifully lit. She is like a carving. And I painted her to look like a carving. And then I put on her a carving of a Sanufo mask. And this Sanufo mask, it's a Capelli mask. The Sanufo are a group from the Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. And this is a mask that is a female mask, even though it is danced by men and it's one of a pair that appears, a male mask and a female mask. This mask is full of iconography that speaks to what beauty amongst the Sanufo means. And this wonderful dark brown, this, this beautiful shine of the wood is a reflection of how Sanufo women are expected to look. 
to take care of their skin, to be smooth and dark and firm. Of course, if you look at African art, anyone who knows African art, it is, it is generally when, there's, when there is a woman, especially, or a female being presented, they are presented in the height of their fecundity, the height of their ability to have children, to contribute to the, uh, the village, etc. They are always well comported. And then there are thorns on the top of the kappa tree. There's all kinds of iconography, but this is a decorative object. I'm not uh, using an antique in my work. I'm now attaching an actual African mask to the canvas. I'm now being more literal around the, my, my reasoning for coupling the the black contemporary body or the black and the African American body to an African mask. That merger, that bringing together of things that have always belonged together. That this is where it all began. And I gotta hand it to Lizzo. She really pulled it off with this image. And I had the best time painting her. I really did. Uh, this is my COVID image. I started it when lockdown began and I finished it maybe last month. And so it's brand new and I immediately bought a frame for it because I saw, I could see it. I saw the whole thing. It's, there's an elegance to this singer, this young woman. There is also um, an artificiality that she builds around her, which is what happens when African art is performed. When an African mask is performed, there's this great artifice and all of the fabrics and the raffia and the, and the bells and the whistles that are part of the performance. Uh, I can see an African coming here and watching some of these performers do their thing on the stage in this country and going, this belongs to Africa. I know, I know I'm not losing it here. I see it, I see it, I understand it. I enjoy it so very much. And so these are the only two nudes in the entire African Diva project. And the bodies that bear in it are some of the most beautiful renditions of what it means to have a black life in this country. The African Diva Project has taken um, many different turns. Uh, part of it is just my need to make the work more expansive. Also, my need to look at popular culture and bring what I'm doing to that table as well. To look at how uh, Black celebrity bodies have been put to work. And um, I had the opportunity to look at the Black Glamour, actually it's a Black Glamour um, mix, a campaign that a very uh, important uh, photographer, Avedon, Richard Avedon, was the initial photographer for that campaign for uh, the Black, these, the very well-known Black mix and that uh, brand is still in effect. And I got a gift from a friend who uh, gave me the story. It was like a catalog of the story behind, you know, how this came about. And as I was going through this catalog, I realized that there was a handful of African-American celebrities that were brought to the first iteration of the, the Black Glamour Mink campaign, which was called um, What Becomes a Legend Most. There were eight, and I pulled all eight out and thought about what I could do with them. It took me about, you ready for this, mm, eight years <laughs> since I have uh, had the catalog. Some things need to marinate for a while before you figure out what you want to do with them. And one day it just dawned on me that it wasn't about what 
becomes a legend most. It was more about who becomes a legend most and how those eight initial celebrities, uh, black celebrities were chosen. So who becomes a legend most is what I did. I, I am a self-taught photoshopper and I am certain that the moment that I actually had the time to concentrate on getting to know that software better, I could probably do what I did to create this print series a lot faster. But I took the, um, the what becomes a legend most and I converted what into who. And, and then I masked the celebrities as I mask my celebrities in the African Diva project. And I, you know, removed the paraphernalia about the consumer product itself and gave Black Pearl, this is Pearl Bailey. Uh, she was one of the, um, the Black Glamour legends in 1972. She was the second, Lena Horne was the first. And so I actually made these, these images and let them marinate for a while as well. And when I did all eight, I realized that I had a series that had something to say. Um, it, didn't, it didn't dawn on me right away, but as I started working with the images, the irony of black mink on black bodies just started to eat away at me. And you know, what the celebrities got was the actual name, but the last one, uh, African-American celebrity, because now they pay models. Now they're models for hire, even though what becomes a legend most remains the campaign slogan. But Janet Jackson is the last one in 2012, and uh, she took a lot of flack for deciding that she wanted to be a legend for Black Glamour. And uh, they had transformed the campaign beyond the uh, magazine page to the billboards. And yeah, Peter got really uh, upset with her and went after her. And her images are much, much more sexualized. And if you look at Pearl Bailey now in her mink coat, you'll see that she is very elegant and she has on her jewelry, her diamonds, etc. And she's, she's doing what Pearl does. You know, it's just very theatrical. Whereas um, Janet Jackson is, is much more sexual, um, much, much more uh, what you would do with a model, you know, how you would pose a model rather than to pose a performer. And I am very proud of this particular uh, collection as well, because there are some of these celebrities who did not have album covers that would work for the African Diva Project for a painting so I can represent these. Even though Lena Horne has a painting, uh, as well as um, a Black Glamour legend. So uh, I, I wanted to sort of give you a sense of where the project is going. Um, I am a painter, but I am an artist, and I am quite excited to try new things and to go in new directions with my work. And who knows where the project is gonna go from here. I'm working on my second African-American female writer. Um, I did Entishaki Shange, and I had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with her at two of the exhibitions where that painting was shown. And I'm always asked, do you, do these women, do these artists know that you have painted them and turned them into African divas? And the answer is not no, um, <laughs> no, no, a couple of them do. Diane Reeves, uh, my brother plays for the Denver Symphony and he met her and gave her a card with the African diva on it. So she knows. Um, and Tshaki, who is very much a diva, even though she is not a, a singer, not a performer, a musician, and I'm working on the second, which I'm not ready to reveal as yet, but you kind of saw me working on, on her image uh, when you came into the studio. 
So the, the painting project continues. Uh, the excitement that I have around actually working with oil on canvas has not gone away. Even though I enjoy doing collage and I enjoy dreaming up things in Photoshop and um, it, it, it fuels my excitement around finding the next diva, deciding on the next diva. I, I am a painter at heart. I, I enjoy the challenge of a really amazing and crazy outfit with lots of folds and crinolines. And, and, and I, you know, I bitch about having to do it. And then I start and I work in layers and I work in glazes and the, and the thrill of getting it right, the challenge when you don't, uh, the fact that it's all for me in the end, that I can always take it off the camp, off the, <laughs> the easel and turn it a, a, along the wall and start again with something else. And the encouragement that I've gotten from pretty much anyone who has seen the work and I've been there in the space where the work has been on view and, and talked to folks about the impact of what I have done. There've been some negative, there's been lots of positive, and both of them keep me painting in this project. Thanks for coming, come back. strikes me and I wait to find